Well, thank you. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, one of the great things about being on a college campus is you meet people from a variety of disciplines. And I've gotten to know people here. And I, I was speaking this morning to an economist. And uh, I told him that I was going to be speaking at TEDx. And he said, what's the topic? And I said, integrity. And he thought it was extremely funny that the first speaker at an integrity conference would be a lawyer. So we have, uh, my profession uh, has developed something of a reputation. And obviously, there are a lot of bad lawyer jokes. I don't think there are as many bad economist jokes. Um, and we've been portrayed in the media and in the news, sometimes deservedly so, uh, as people perhaps who are not paragons of integrity. What I want to do today is talk to you about integrity and lawyers and try to shed a different light on um, lawyers with integrity. And when we speak of integrity and we think about lawyers and the profession of law, typically what we think about is um, traits like honesty, acting in good faith, observing rules of professional ethics, all of which is very important. But what I want to talk about today is going to be something a little bit different. It's going to be a somewhat different uh, definition of integrity. But uh, let me start by telling you a little bit about myself. I attended the College of Worcester from 1972 to 1976. I was here during the Vietnam era. I was here uh, when Watergate was happening. And um, I was very undecided about my career when I came to Worcester. I knew that I wanted to do something to help people. I wanted to do something that made a contribution to society. Um, but I was considering a number of options. And it really wasn't until my senior year that I decided to go to law school. I had a lot of influences. I, there were influences here. I was influenced by what was going on in the world around me. Um, and I was also influenced, I suppose, uh, by music. I was a musician. I used to run a coffee house in the basement of Westminster Church House. It was called Zeitgeist. I used to play guitar and sing. And I used to book all the acts of other students who would come and play guitar and sing. I was very much into the music of the 60s and the early 70s. I was a huge Bob Dylan fan. I still am a big Bob Dylan fan. Um, but there was really nothing in the music of Bob Dylan that inspired me to want to go to law school. I majored in English. I studied American literature, English literature. I studied Shakespeare. I loved Shakespeare. I still do to this day. But again, there was really nothing in Shakespeare that inspired me to want to go to law school. While I was here, there was a movie uh, that came out when I was a student. It was called The Paper Chase. And I suspect a lot of you probably aren't familiar with it. But it was a very popular movie at the time. It was about a young man who go went to Harvard Law School and his experience as a first year student at Harvard Law School. His name was Hart. He had a professor named Kingsfield. And Kingsfield was uh, a brilliant scholar. He was uh, the first year contracts professor. He was pompous. He was arrogant. He was removed and aloof. Um, and um, the movie portrayed law school as being a horrific experience, being terribly cutthroat, academically incredibly challenging. Uh, at one point, Kingsfield uh, embarrassed Hart in front of the entire first year contracts class, telling him he wasn't likely to become a lawyer. And perversely, for some reason, that movie motivated me to want all the more to look into going to law school. Um, there was something about the challenge of it, something about the competition of it uh, that attracted me, despite um, what that film was trying to do. Now, the entertainment industry has not been kind to lawyers. Uh, we're portrayed as sharks. We're portrayed as just bad people. Um, and uh, again, sometimes that's well-deserved, but other times it certainly is not. Um, I think the worst portrayal in film of lawyers is in Jurassic Park. And I don't know if you remember the lawyer in Jurassic Park, but he is not a paragon of virtue. He's not somebody that you would admire at all. Uh, he's the lawyer who represents Jurassic Park. And he meets his demise, uh, if you recall, being eaten by a Tyrannosaurus Rex while sitting on a toilet. Uh, so uh, I can only imagine what Steven Spielberg was thinking about lawyers when he directed that, that scene and that character. 
but we're not always portrayed as people lacking integrity. Um, and sometimes the entertainment industry does portray lawyers as people of integrity. One uh, example of that um, is uh, Sir Thomas More. If you, a historical figure, but also a character in a play by Robert Bolt called A Man for All Seasons, made into a very uh, successful film, I think also probably back in the 70s. Sir Thomas More was a lawyer in, in 16th century England. He was Lord Chancellor uh, under Henry VIII, and he was a man of great integrity. He was a man who stuck to his principles. When Henry VIII wanted him to uh, recognize Henry as the supreme head of the English church when Henry was breaking from Rome, and also wanted to recognize that his marriage to Catherine of Aragon was not valid so that he could then go and marry Anne Boleyn, uh, Thomas More refused. And what ended up happening, because he stuck to his principles and because he was a person and a lawyer of such great integrity, uh, was he was beheaded. Uh, in, that's a true story as well as just a great uh, play uh, and film if you ever get a chance to see it. I think uh, in literature, uh, the greatest hero for lawyers is Atticus Finch, which was, uh, the, who was the main character of the book To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee and the film uh, that starred Gregory Peck. And um, what a great man he was, even though he was just a fictional character. Atticus Finch, for those who don't know, was a lawyer in Alaba a small town in Alabama in the 1930s. He was a lawyer of, of a great reputation. He, had, he was a widower. He had two young children. And he was a man of integrity in every sphere of existence. He uh, decided to represent a man named Tom Robinson, who was a black man who was wrongly accused of raping a white woman. And back in the rural south in the 1930s, taking on the defense of a, a, a case like that was not exactly a very popular thing for a lawyer to do. Atticus was risking his career, his reputation. Uh, he was risking the interests of his children um, to take on this case. But he took it on because he believed in the innocence of his client, and he believed that his client deserved uh, a defense for such a serious crime. And so he put his own welfare at risk to take on this case. Now, people like Atticus Finch are not confined to fiction. Uh, one of my favorite examples in real life of a person with integrity, a lawyer with integrity, was John Adams. I have a special affinity for John Adams because he was from Boston. He practiced law in Boston uh, before the Revolutionary War, before he became president. And um, he did a lot of great things. Uh, I had the privilege a couple of years ago of serving as president of the Boston Bar Association. We trace our origins to meetings that John Adams convened in the late 1700s of lawyers in Boston. So we claim him as our own. John Adams uh, was the primary author of the Massachusetts Constitution, which became one of the models for the United States Constitution. And it incorporated principles like the right to a jury trial, the right to due process, the independence of the judiciary, um, the right to access uh, to justice and equal access. Um, and, and so John Adams, and as a lawyer of tremendous integrity, really started laying the foundation for the rule of law in American government. And one of the things he did that we still talk about and we still use as an example for people is, um, like Atticus Finch, he took on a very popular case, unpopular case. Uh, John Adams agreed to represent British soldiers who had been accused of murdering five Bostonians uh, who were members of a mob in Boston. They said it was self-defense, but they were accused of murder. And most lawyers who'd been approached to represent the British soldiers refused to take the case because they knew they would be putting their own futures and careers at risk. But John Adams took the case, represented them, and was successful uh, in representing them as well. So the rule of law, uh, which is something that lawyers of integrity do talk about a little bit and, and embody in many ways, uh, says that we are a government of laws and not of men. And it is a rule of law that 
uh, really protects our liberties and keeps us all uh, safe from unfair government intrusion. The rule of law also says that no person is above the law, and we've seen that uh, history really has proven that to be true. So um, what I want to do now, I've been talking about people in literature, people in history who are lawyers of great integrity. But integrity is not confined to the literary imagination. It's not confined to historical relics. There are people today, every day, practicing law who exhibit tremendous integrity. And what I'd like to do with the remainder of my time is just tell you about some examples. And these are examples that I've become familiar with uh, because of my involvement in the Boston Bar Association. Um, and they're just a few examples because time is limited. But the examples I'm going to give you are typical of some of the great work that lawyers do day in and day out all over the country, preserving the rule of law and demonstrating integrity in the profession. And first I want to talk to you about Guantanamo. Everybody knows what Guantanamo is. It's the detention camp um, it, at which many uh, alleged enemy combatants were brought from Afghanistan, and they were rounded up and accused of being enemy combatants, but there was really no fair process put in place for them to defend themselves, for them to have any prospect of ever being released from detention. They were just going to be there indefinitely with no due process and no rule of law applying to, uh, to them at all. Hundreds of lawyers across the country agreed to represent these detainees on a pro bono basis. And um, they've gone back and forth to Guantanamo. Each lawyer was assigned to a, a different detainee. And uh, a number of these detainees, I think, really were innocent of the charges. Certainly some, no doubt, were truly enemy combatants, but many were not. And through the work over more than a decade now of these hundreds of volunteer lawyers spending hundreds of thousands of hours and law firms and other organizations spending tens of millions of dollars, a number of the wrongfully held detainees have been released and have been returned to their families. The work is still going on. There are still over 100 people detained, perhaps some of them correctly, perhaps some of them not. And the, some lawyers are still working on these cases. The process, because of their work, a process was adopted to give these people uh, an opportunity to defend themselves. And uh, a few years ago, we honored some of the volunteer lawyers at the Boston Bar Association who were engaged in this work. On the other end of the spectrum, another example of lawyers with integrity is work that uh, was done, a project that was started at the Boston Bar Association for Veterans. These are veterans returning home from Afghanistan and Iraq. And um, they come to these yellow ribbon events. When they come back home, they have legal issues that need to be addressed, and the government does not supply them uh, with attorneys to represent them or assist them with their legal needs. Some of them might be reservists who uh, have difficulties with their employers because of the length of time that they've been gone. Some of them might have problems with landlords. Some of them might have domestic problems. So a group of lawyers at the Boston Bar Association got together and um, started a program where they attend Yellow Ribbon events and they volunteer to provide free counsel to the returning veterans for whatever their legal needs are. Uh, again, this to me, lawyers who are preserving and protecting the rule of law, who are providing representation, important representation, to people who otherwise couldn't afford it and who deserve it, um, is to me a definition of integrity. There are certainly plenty of lawyers who dedicate their careers to working for the poor and meeting the legal needs of the poor. Um, they work in legal services organizations all over the country. Those organizations are, uh, have been going through tremendous funding difficulties for reasons I don't have time to go into. And um, those organizations do get some support from state and federal governments. Every year, um, the Boston Bar Association and the Massachusetts Bar Association sponsor an event called the Walk to the Hill where hundreds of lawyers take a few hours out of their days. They walk to the State House in Beacon Hill in, in Boston, and they advocate uh, for funding for legal services organizations. We also have lawyers that go into the Boston public schools 
and they teach children about the legal system and about the rule of law, all on a volunteer basis. And then one of the things that I think we're most, I'm most proud of at least, and not because I had much to do with it, I didn't, but uh, a couple of years before I became president of the BBA, uh, there was a task force formed that looked at ways to reduce the risk of innocent people being wrongly convicted of crimes. So they looked at things like access to DNA evidence, they looked at things like interrogation techniques, and they spent over a year studying these issues, all volunteer time, um, and came up with a, a detailed report with specific recommendations, some of which now have been adopted into law. And um, what is most remarkable to me about the task force is it didn't just consist of defense attorneys, it included prosecutors, it included law enforcement uh, people because all of them share an interest in the rule of law and making sure that our system works accurately and fairly and correctly. And so they volunteered hundreds of hours of time to this project. And these to me are examples uh, of lawyers with integrity. I want to end by showing you this envelope. This is a letter I received when I was a student here at the college. You can see it's got my mailbox address over in Lowry on it. The postal, the, the stamp on it says October 13, 1974. That's the postmark. And then I love the stamp in the corner. It says United States, 10 cents. It was a 10 cent postage stamp. And it says, uh, it has a picture of the Jefferson Memorial and it says we hold these truths, which are the words from the Declaration of Independence uh, written by Thomas Jefferson. This was the envelope that carried a letter that influenced my decision to go to law school. It was a letter from my uncle. And um, he, he knew I was struggling with the decision of what to do after I graduated college. He knew I wanted to find a meaningful career where I could help people, where I could give back to society, maybe have a positive impact in some way. And he believed that the way to do that was to go to law school. He really wanted to see me go in that direction. And so he, he uh, said in the letter basically that if you go to law school, if you become a lawyer, if you develop a good reputation, you will be able to influence people in a very positive way and make some real positive change in the, change in the world. He um, lived long enough to see me go to law school and become a lawyer. Uh, he passed away six years after this letter was written. But I still have the letter and I keep it uh, on a shelf in my bedroom because it meant so much to me. One of the things he said in the letter was go to law school, become well known, then you will be heard. Well, I went to law school, I became a little bit well known, um, and I want to thank you for hearing me today. Thank you very much.